Good morning, everyone. Happy Palm Sunday to you, and uh, good to have you, everyone, with us on Facebook Live this morning. Unfortunately, uh, we had uh, last-minute technical difficulties, so we're only streaming to one of our providers, so Facebook Live people, hello. Go grab everybody else who was uh, supposedly on YouTube and our Facebook, or on our, our, our website, and bring them on to Facebook Live. Um, apologize for that. Um, they don't let you know until the last minute, unfortunately, and that's the problem with technology. So, uh, what we're, we're here for Palm Sunday. Glad that you could spend it with us. I uh, got some really exciting details uh, coming up uh, with this service and um, everything that's, that's uh, coming up in the future. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you so much to our volunteers for yesterday. Um, we offered food and they came. Um, so you came out not only just for the pizza, but you came out for the work, and uh, the place looks beautiful. Thank you so much for uh, uh, being the worker bees that you were yesterday. Uh, I know how fun it is to spread mulch. Yeehaw, right? Um, you got your palm crosses this morning. Everybody got a palm cross? Uh, if you didn't grab one, grab one uh, from the table back there. Miss Cecilia did an awesome job, as she always does with those. She added a little bit. Um, different uh, little ribbon to, uh, this year. But we want to make sure that uh, you have a way to invite people to Easter service. This is a great opportunity for you to do so. Uh, grab um, a cross on your way out, maybe use it as a way to invite somebody to Easter service, either in person or online. Uh, so feel free to do so at the very end of the service. And of course, our Holy Week begins this week uh, with Palm Sunday today, and then we have two extra services this week, in case you did not know, and that is our Maundy Thursday service at 7 p.m., very special service that we celebrate communion together because it is the very first time that Jesus instituted communion, and we remember that night, um, remembering Passover. And then also on Friday, Good Friday worship service, um, that will be also at 7 p.m. It'll be a service of darkness, although we were talking today, and I don't know how dark it's going to be now that we've changed time. <laughs> so sometimes we catch it on the, on the before Eastern uh, daylight time, but not this year. So uh, both of those services, Monday, or I'm sorry, Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday, 7 p.m. until around 7.30, 7.40 and we'll be streaming all of that online as well. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. We'll only have one service, and uh, we're going to practice safe uh, COVID protocols as well. Uh, we do want to mention, if you have more, or you anticipate six or more people attending with you, let us know in advance because uh, we want to keep you guys together, and uh, we want to provide, of course, safety at the same time. So. Give us a call at the office or email us at office at messiahwilmington.org, uh, any party six or more, and uh, we can pre-plan and make you feel comfortable at the same time. So today we are celebrating our last Sunday of the month, month which means that we have our liturgical service, and we will be taking that from the hymnal itself, page 151 in the hymnal, if you want to follow along there. Of course, we'll have everything up on our slides to make sure that you can follow along. Uh, communion this morning, I uh, just want to mention that uh, we will be practicing again social distancing. Uh, we will have a continuous line like we have done so in the past, and as the ushers uh, uh, usher you forward, please keep a six-foot distance between your family and the next family. Uh, receive the uh, bread, um, the, the body of Christ, by simply cupping your hand, please, because I will be dropping it into your hand without touching your hand. So just please come forward with a cupped hand, and uh, I will give you the bread, and uh, Mr. AJ will give you the wine in an individual cup. Everything has been spaced appropriately for safety measures. We will be masked and gloved because you've got to receive without a mask. Uh, so we want to make sure that that is safe. And then as you proceed forward, you can just uh, place your empty individual cup here in this basket on your way back. If you feel at all uncomfortable to receive communion this way, 
We do understand, and that's why we've offered uh, individual communion kits. Just please ask me uh, for an individual communion kit. I will give that to you, and uh, you can proceed back to your seat and uh, receive communion that way. For those of you online who are receiving communion, uh, please wait until I address you at that time in the service, and I'll invite you to take and eat and take and drink. So have your individual communion kit at the ready uh, and we'll be set. Lastly, we are starting something new today and that is we're starting up coffee time. I thought there would be like thunderous applause, you know. <laughs> Coffee, guys, come on. No, um, we're, we're, we're going to start up coffee time in a very safe manner as well. In the fellowship hall after the service, you are, are welcome to join us. So we may actually take it outside. Who knows how many people will join. But uh, we have coffee for you, and we will serve as much as you want. Um, so maybe we should have had it before the service <laughs> this morning. But please join us after the, the service in the fellowship hall. And if you have any questions along the way, please don't hesitate to ask them. Information Center is where you want to go. And I do want to mention, if you're brand new with us today, we do want to make sure that we welcome you appropriately at the Information Center. Grab your first-time guest gift. And uh, we'd love to know where you're from, so please stop by before you leave. And if you skip everything else, ask me along the way out um, if you have any questions as well. So welcome to those of you online to our Palm Sunday service. Welcome to those of us here. And let's begin then our whole service by singing our opening hymn. Let's stand together. And again, we are beginning on page 151 in our hymnal, or follow along on the slides. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all and we pause in silence for reflection.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. And due to Lent, we will skip the hymn of praise and turn to 156 for our collect of the day. The Lord be with you. And let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God the Father, who sent your Son to take our nature upon him and to suffer death on the cross that mankind should follow the example of his great humility, mercifully grant that we both follow the example of our Savior Jesus Christ in his patience and also have our portion in his resurrection. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please, you may be seated. Our first reading is taken from Paul's letter to Philippi, chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, very well-known verses by so many. Paul writes, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join as we stand together and we sing our Lenten verse, Return to the Lord. Let's stand and sing.
and the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 12th chapter. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And this is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we continue with the singing of our next hymn. first thing people do when restoring old furniture is to strip it down to the bare wood to see what the original might have looked like and determine if the thing is worth doing over. They strip away all the years of grime and cheap paint piled on top of each other. They get rid of all the junk that's been tacked on through the years and try to find the solid simple thing that's underneath. You know I'm kind of like an old chair and need a repair. Every now and then, I have to take a hard look at all the layers that have been built up in my heart over the days, weeks, the years. All the attempts to slap on a coat of paint to hide the imperfections. I have to allow the Holy Spirit of God to strip off all those old layers to get down to the bare original so He can begin to fill the cracks, sand the rough edges, and finish and polish and seal me and make my heart a beautiful thing. And yes, He's already looked beneath the layers and has determined that I'm worth doing over, and so are you. We have been talking about this idea of character, and five weeks ago we began with this very definition, which really is the basis for our entire series, Restore. Character, as Scripture defines it, the will to do what is right as God defines right regardless of the cost. And we took time to 
break apart that definition in many different ways. The problem is, isn't so much that, you know what, when it comes to right and wrong, that I don't know the difference, all right? There, there's a lot of things involved in that. The big problem is this, the will that I don't necessarily have the will to do what is right. I mean, I'll, I'll have the will to point out in other people what they need to do what is right. That's easy, but just for me, if I take that alone, that's difficult for me to look in the mirror and to say, you know what, I need to do this right. But it's more on the line of, I don't necessarily do what's right repeatedly. I don't do what is right all the time, which is very difficult. But this is where the good news is stepping in for us, that God says, I don't want you to. That's what he's saying. He's saying the good news is this, I don't want you to manufacture what you can't manufacture. You can manufacture a better self, but I don't want you to manufacture that. I will, if you will allow me, produce through you, produce through you the real character of what I want you to live as. That is my goal for you. And so throughout this series, we've been looking at this and we've been saying this, that at the same time, God is constantly, if you didn't know it this morning, right now, in this very moment, God is constantly working in you, in me. And it can all be summarized by this little word called renew. Renew. That God is promising through scripture to do this. A renewed mind results in a transformed life. A renewed mind results in a transformed life because this right here is what God is doing. He is transforming you and me into the character of Jesus Christ. So we look like him, so we behave like him, so we believe like him, so we see like him. A renewed mind results in a transformed life. We said that this renewal process, which is to make new, is a two-step process. And one more time, we're going to say this all together. Two-step process. The first step is this. Take off the what? Old. Old. And second step is to put on the what? New. Put on the new. We said it's just like taking off nail polish, right? It's taking off all the gunk from restoring furniture or anything that is of woodwork or of value. Taking off the old, that is taking off the lies. Here's the thing. You've believed in lies. You've believed and acted on those lies. Maybe from people who, rose, or who, who were able to raise you in terms of a child. And you've begun to believe lies from culture. It is so easy to be able to believe in lies. We want to take that off. We don't want to believe in lies. No, we want to believe in the truth. So we've talked about this putting on the new because God is saying, you know what? I'm wise enough to know that if I was to just give you a bunch of commands, thou shalt and thou shalt not, you would only get at best a better version of yourself. And you might just once in a while put on the old without knowing it. I want to do better than that. I want to do what you cannot do. I want to transform you into the character of Christ. And if you will allow me, I want you to then partner with me in what I am at constant work doing in you. Taking off the old and putting on the new. Putting on the new truth. Putting on the new thing that's going to lead you to be transformed. Changed completely. So last week, we began talking about what putting on the new means. And I challenged you to actually do something in light of that, and hopefully you had a chance to at least do one of them. We're going to get to more of that uh, today. But putting on the new is this. Learn to counter the specific lies you are most tempted to believe with the specific truths from God's Word. Because we looked at the most clearest example possible. It was Jesus when he was tempted. And each time Jesus was tempted, did he pray? No. Each time Jesus was tempted, did he attend temple? No. Each time Jesus was tempted, he responded in the very same manner again and again. It is written. Say that with me. It is written. And I challenge you to do that last week. That for you and for me, we don't need to pray when we're tempted. We don't need to attend church when we're tempted. No. God modeled for us through Jesus. 
You need to have the specific truth on the tip of your tongue, on the edge of your brain, to be able to counter the specific lie that you're tempted to believe with a truth. It is written. So today, you're going to need that handout that you were passed out uh, this morning. Um, if you're online this morning, that handout will be available probably tomorrow um, under the Watch Messages section and just go to today's uh, message and you can download that handout. But if you have that handout, you're going to need that today because we're going to go through that. If you don't have a handout, can you raise your hand? Anybody not have a handout? Okay, guest services team, can you catch these people? Keep your hand up. They, they don't know who you are. We need some up front and we need some in the back there. Keep your hand up. People, people, hand up. You want not go get one. Okay, good. One over here and two in the back there. Over here. Okay, look at all that. Okay, because you're going to need that handout, and it's very, 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 hopefully, valuable for you. Also, with the handouts this morning, if you would, please take out your Bibles. We're going to be turning to John chapter 8 quick, and uh, that is in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. That is the fourth gospel. Jesus is going to give us the principle that basically his version of the principle that we've been talking about these past five weeks. And these are very familiar words. Uh, John chapter 8, Jesus right here has already predicted his death. He's predicted his resurrection. And with all of that, suddenly there's this group, this group of Jewish people who believe that suddenly Jesus is the Son of God. They, they automatically now believe Jesus is the Messiah. So what Jesus is doing is he's leaning in to these people who are now believing in him, and he is addressing their newfound faith as new believers. But these are very familiar verses that so many of us have heard so many times and verses that have been taken out of context so many times. Okay, chapter 8, verse 31. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, he's talking to this new small group of Jewish people who believe he's the Messiah. He says, if, if you abide in my word, if is a very, very, very important word. I should have highlighted that. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Your Bible might say, if you hold to my teachings, you are then truly my disciples. Now, we said this word abide. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. This word abide is not a complicated word. It's actually a word that means abide. Like you abide in your home, you abide in a dwelling. It's remaining in, staying in, living in. So Jesus is saying, if you are going to follow me, if you are going to be my disciple, if you're going to allow me to do the work in you that I want to do and to change you and transform you. If, then you need to abide. You need to remain. You need to live in. You need to saturate yourself with what? My word, the truth. And then look at this, the promise, verse 37, and you will know the truth, and everybody say it, and the truth will set you free. Now, don't miss this. Because Jesus said the key to change is knowing, saturating yourself with, abiding in God's Word, and that truth will set you free. Perhaps you're somebody this morning, and you dropped out of church. You dropped out of Christianity. You gave up at some point in time. It's most likely that you believed in something. Excuse me. Drop this. You believed in something that said this, if thouest attendest churches, thou shalt be set free. Got a little Irish accent going on there. If, if, if thou shalt attend church on a regular basis, thou shalt be set free. And, and you went to church all the time, and you didn't change. And you brought your wife or you brought your husband to church because certainly going to church will change them. But they didn't change. And you brought your kids. They didn't change. And you even prayed that your marriage would change. You prayed that a relationship would change. And it's like, uh-oh, 
What's all that about? Listen, there is no correlation in all of Scripture that says, if you pray, you will be set free. There's no correlation in Scripture that says, you know what, if you attend church, your transformation in your character is going to happen. No. Not at all. In fact, I don't want to pick on any of you this morning, but as Christians, maybe we've leaned on this premise that if I can just get into the building on Sunday, if, if I can just get some of that hour on my kids, they're certainly going to be changed. That's not what Jesus said. He said, if you want to change your character, that is, if you don't want to be greedy anymore, if you want to learn how to forgive, if you want to make sure that you don't get angry at the times that you should not get angry, whatever it is regarding your character, if you want to see transformation, no, saturate, abide in my word that is in my truth, and only then will you be set free. It's not church attendance. It's not prayer. It's nothing else. It's knowing the truth, and the truth will set you free. Paul said it this way. We are transformed by the renewal of our minds. The way that we're transformed into the, the character of Jesus Christ is knowing the truth as God works and renews, taking off the old and putting on the new. And we are therefore transformed. We are changed. So this morning, what I want to do is I want to give you an arsenal of truth, right? Because it's that truth that's going to set us free. I want to give you an arsenal of truth. It's not a complete uh, listing of truth. There's so many more. But these are areas that I wrestle with. These are areas that no doubt you wrestle with periodically or maybe all the time. And I want to give you these, and I want to be able to show you how you can integrate these into your life so that... We can take off the old and put on the new, and we can specifically address each lie with specific truth from God's Word to be set free. So this morning on that handout, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through this, and I want you to listen, but I want you to take notes along the way because I want you to make this uh, very much uh, applicable to your life. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is there's a bunch of those. I want to challenge you to at least do two of these, all right? I'm going to challenge you to take these verses and memorize them. Memorize them, and as you memorize them, you're going to have them on the tip of your tongue. You're going to have them on the edge of your brain to be able to say what? It is written against those lies and against those temptations, okay? So everybody have their hand out this morning? All right, first one here. Thought life. The lie, all right, the lie is this, I can't help what I think about. Ever heard of that lie? We tell that all the time, right? The truth is, Colossians chapter 3, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Now listen, if you are tempted in your thought life and, and you see somebody really handsome or somebody really beautiful and they're walking down the aisle and your thought life tends to go, woo, you know, you on the tip of your tongue need to be able to recite this. It is written maybe under your breath. So I'm going to set my mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth, for I have died and my life is hidden with Christ in God. And hopefully by the time you get done with that whole statement, that person is down the aisle and your temptation has been averted, okay? In your thought life, if you like to win conversations in your head, you ever done that before? Ooh, I'd like to give it to them this way, and you start to imagine, ooh, if I could, and ooh, somehow you always win, right, in those kind of conversations. What do you need to have? On the tip of your tongue, in your mind, you need to be able to say, it is written self, I'm not setting my mind on things that are on the earth. I'm setting my mind on things that are above. It is written. See how that works? And you say it and you address the specific lie with the specific truth. Next one. Consequence of sin. Here's the lie. Certain sins have no consequences. The truth is this. James chapter 1, 15 through 16. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. 
Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. All of us need to know. All of us need to have this on the tip of our tongues because all of us believe there is some sort of sin out there that there's just no consequence. It is just so small of a sin that if I do it. But here's the thing. That brings forth death. Did you know that? That's the truth of it. Any sin brings forth death. That's why Jesus died. To die for those sins, that's what it equated to. Listen, you've either killed a marriage at some point in time, you've killed relationships, maybe you've killed your finances, maybe you've killed a reputation based on that specific sin. And some of you might go, well, I didn't see a death, but sometimes the death takes a while. Sometimes it's not immediate. Sometimes it's years before you even see a death. Many of us have had habits that have maybe caused a death, maybe hurt us or hurt others. When it comes down to it, we need to have on the tip of our tongues when we are at that point in time and we're saying, oh, but it's just a wee little sin and a wee little sin it is. Nobody's going to know. I just want it. Mm -mm -mm. Tip of our tongue, pop into our mind. It is written. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. I will not be deceived. Tip of your tongue, you need to say, it is written. Next one, honesty. Uh, the lie with honesty is this, lying and dishonesty does not hurt me. The truth of the matter is Colossians chapter 3, 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have what? Put off the old self with its practices, we've looked at this before, and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We lie for so many reasons. And God says, when you lie, even if it's a little lie, when you are dishonest, you are working against me in what I'm trying to constantly do in you. What is he doing in us? He's trying to renew us. And we're sabotaging his efforts. We're hurting ourselves. We need to have on the tip of our tongue, it is written, I will be honest for I have put off my old self and put on the new. I will not lie. I have put off the old self and put on the new. It is written. Forgiveness. Next one. The lie. I want to forgive, <laughs> but they don't deserve it. I want to forgive, but they don't necessarily deserve it. We don't forgive often because we think if we do, we're going to let them off the hook. Because I need to punish that person, right? Because if I don't, who is going to? That better not happen again, so I'm going to make sure. We often don't forgive because of that. But here's the truth. Ephesians chapter 4, 32 and on. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Why do we forgive? Because God in Christ forgave me. That's why we forgive. He goes on. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. If you have a problem forgiving, you can and ought to forgive because you yourself have been forgiven. If you're going through the process of, i got to get to that point of forgiving this person, here it is, tip of your tongue. It is written, I ought to forgive one another as God in Christ forgave me. Shorten that up if that's all you can memorize. Forgive as God in Christ forgave me. It is written. Going on, pride. How about this one? The lie, I think I'm something. And we think everybody else around us certainly isn't that something, right? I think I'm something. And so many of us, our character is wrapped around this. For some of us, it is very difficult to actually be wrong because I got to protect my pride. I got to lie in order to keep my pride going. Here's the truth. Jeremiah 9.23, this is a long one. You may want to shorten this one. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boasts in this that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who protects steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, declares 
the Lord that before you open up your mouth and you go down that pride road, you ought to have, it is written. It is written. If I boast in anything, it'll be that my heavenly Father understands me and I understand him. In that, he delights. It is written. Next one, change. Now, oh, this is a big one. The lie with change. I don't believe I can change. Why? Well, because my mama, it, she did it, and her mama, she did it, and her mama, she did it, and probably Eve did it too. You know, my daddy, he was this way, and his daddy was that. As though we can't change because it's in our genes. That's a lie. Here's the truth. Here's the truth. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Do you know your relatives? Do you know all the people that did things before you and you think you can't break the chain? Do you know that they chose to set themselves to be conformed to this world? Paul is saying you don't have to be conformed to this world. You don't have to be conformed to their pattern that they set as a precedent for you. Do not be conformed to this world. In other words, how do we be transformed? By the renewal of your mind. That by testing, uh, let's go back, by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And as soon as you think, you know what, I here I'm going through it again. I just can't change. I just can't change. I just can't help it. Tip of your tongue. I will not be conformed to this world, but I will be transformed by the renewal of my mind. Tip of your tongue, it is written. See how that all works? Okay, turn the page. We're going to go to uh, anger and revenge. The lie for this is the same as forgiveness. I should be angry at them and deserve revenge uh, because they deserve revenge and they deserve it. Yeah. I should be angry at them and desire revenge because they deserve it. Some of you have had anger for a long time. Some of you have had anger and it's touched every single part of your character and you don't know how to live without it. It's time you know the truth and not give in to this lie. The truth is James 1, 19 through 20. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And here's the truth that's going to set you free. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Listen, you could stand up here and you could, we could have an open mic session. You know, let's have an open mic session. Tell us why you're angry. You could tell us the reason and we'd all agree. You should be angry for that. I'd feel the same way. But here's the truth. That anger does not produce the righteousness of God. It actually works against what God is trying to do in your life. So the times that you just want to spout off in your anger, you need to have an it is written. It is written. I need to be quick to listen, slow to speak. That's it. It is written. Self, quick to listen, slow to speak. I'm going to deal with him again. Quick to listen. Slow to speak. I got to listen to that again. Quick to listen, as painful as it is, slow to speak. Next one, speech. The lie. I can't help myself saying that. And for all of you who like to season and pepper this with, oh, bless her heart, bless his heart, boom, right? I just can't help myself, right? That's a lie. Here's the truth, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, and I love this last part, that it may give grace to those who hear. Imagine if you were the person, the family, the neighbor, a church, that out of anything, you would be governed in your speech by grace. And the only thing that you spoke would be to build up another person and give them grace. If you have a hard time controlling your mouth, you need to have this, it is written, I'm not going to let any corrupting talk come forth. 
it is written. Or how about this one? It is written, ah, I will give grace to that person who hears. Now, you might be thinking, okay, this is, this is nice. It's a lot. You want me to memorize? Remember, we talked a little bit about memorization last week. You want me to memorize all of this? Well, I want you to start with two. But listen, this is survival. This is survival. And it's survival because you have one of two choices. The one choice is this. Just try better. That's one choice. Or the other choice is this. Partner with God with what he's already doing in your life to counter the lies with a specific truth. To be transformed because he's renewing. Listen, this is all about good old discipline. This is all about the memory verses that you used to memorize maybe when you were younger. But here's the thing. When you have it on the tip of your tongue, you're able to counter the lie. You're able to use the truth that Jesus said towards transformation. And guess what you get out of it? You get set free from whatever that lie is. Not church attendance, not prayer. The truth. Finish these out. Selfishness. This is a big one. The lie, my deal is more important than their deal. How many times do you do that? A day. Truth is this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant or more important than yourselves. And this is the way I do it. I think of the person who is more important in my life than myself. And I have a lot of people, but there is someone. And I then picture that person, I picture the people around me with his face. That's a person I respect. And so I picture everybody with his face as often as I can because then I'm able to treat that person more important than myself. That's a way to integrate this into your thinking. And if you slide back, you can always say, it is written, I'm going to treat her, I'm going to treat him more significant than myself. It is written. Next one, materialism, the lie. As soon as, then I will be content. As soon as I have, as soon as I purchase, as soon as I do, then I will be content. But is there ever an end to as soon as? I've never seen it. There's never an end. And so right away, you know, this can be whole in terms of our character and get wrapped up. But there's a prayer. I actually gave this to you a couple weeks ago. And I gave the first part to you because I said, you're not going to like the second part. And actually, somebody pointed out, and they were paying attention that Sunday. They said, it, they said, you got it wrong, Timothy. It was not psalm. It was a proverb, right? You were correct. It was a proverb, not a psalm. I incorrectly put it down. I want you to pray this whole prayer. Look at how dangerous this prayer is. Proverbs 30, verse 8. This is the truth. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. In other words, give me only what I can handle, God. Give me only what I can handle. Lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Stuff will distract you from God. Period. So you need to have it on the tip of your tongue. It is written. God, give me only what I can handle, lest I be full and deny you. God, give me only what I can handle, lest I be full and deny you. God, I'm going into the supermarket, and I know I'm going to want to buy every single thing on the shelf. God, you know, it's not a prayer. It is written. Give me only what I can handle, lest I be full and deny you. And if that scares you, by the way, it may mean that you haven't surrendered at all to God, all right? That's another subject. Authority. Here we go. Big one. The lie. I don't need to keep the rule I don't agree with. I don't need to keep a rule I don't agree with. Have you ever struggled with this one? I struggle with it every single day. All right? Every single day, I go out of my neighborhood, and there are these two silly little stop signs that my HOA 
put up, all right, on a private road. There is hardly any traffic. Why in the world would you want to put these two little stop signs, all right? And yeah, I'm part of the HOA board now, but that was before, okay? So that doesn't matter. So that doesn't even count. Why do I need to, you know what, I'm just going, I'm not, I don't agree with it. I'm not even going to bother stopping at those stop signs. That kind of attitude put people in jail. In fact, some of your greatest regrets come from this, right? Listen to the truth. The truth is Romans chapter 13. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist, those authorities, have been instituted by God. In other words, God allowed those silly little stop signs to be there. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. You know what the Apostle Paul, who eventually was killed by the Roman government, you know what he told people? He told people, you better listen to the Romans. You better obey the Romans because obeying Roman law is to obey God. And then you know what happened? Christianity took over Rome. God is in control. God knows what he's doing. If you've got a problem with authority, if you've got a problem with any kind of law, as long as it is the right thing to do, you need to go and have an it is written. Fill your heart and mind with this authority that exists has been instituted by God. This person who is my authority exists because they have been instituted by God. It is written. Last one, relationships. This should be a big one. I can control how my relationships affect me. All right? This is beyond teenage years, people. This is at all time. I can control how my relationships affect me. Well, the truth is Proverbs 13, 20. We've gone through this before. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. No matter how old you are, you're affected by this because everyone around you determines. If the people you do life with, the people you hang out with, the people you surround yourself with will determine the quality and the direction of your life. They will. And whenever you're making decisions about relationships, you need to have it on the tip of your tongue. It is written. You know what? I want to walk with the wise in order to become wise. I will not become a companion of fools and suffer harm. Tip of your tongue. It is written. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, all right? There's so many more truths, and I want you to find them. But again, last week I said go beyond the devotional mentality of using the Bible, which is great, but go beyond the three verses a day. Get into God's Word, the truth, and find these things that you wrestle with so that you can give that specific lie the specific truth. I want you to challenge you, two of these, memorize these, okay? Write them out on a card if you have to. I gave you index cards last week to be able to write that out, put it on your mirror, put it in your car so that you are memorizing it so you can have it on the tip of your tongue. It is written, okay? Cut up the, the handout I gave you and stick that somewhere, all right? Do it because it's crucial. And then four things I want you to do at the very bottom of the sheet, on that second page, four things. And if you're taking notes, you might want to scribble these uh, notes next to it. Number one, I put speak the truth. Listen, say these verses out loud, all right? Or say them under your breath. There's just a power in saying it. It's just like what Jesus did. He, he said it. He didn't have to say it. He was God. He could have just thunk it, all right? He said it to Satan. It is written, all right? Speak it. Speak it out under your breath. Or you know you're going to go into a place and it's going to be tempting. You just, it is written. You just say it to like that, all right? It's just a power behind it. Number two, personalize the truth that has put yourself into this verse. Put a pronoun, I. Put a, a name, Timothy, all right? Timothy, treat that person more important than yourself, all right? Or, I want to be wise, so I'm going to walk with the wise. You just keep on saying that. Personalize the it is written. It becomes more powerful. Number three, pray the truth. That is, lay a daily foundation 
for the truth. As I've said, you know your temptations. If you don't know them, ask the person next to you. They know, or ask your loved ones. They know what you're tempted with. They are predictable. So pray and get it on your mind ahead of time. Lay the anchor, lay the foundation. You know what, today I'm gonna to be struggling with this, I'm gonna be struggling with her, I'm gonna be struggling with him. I know that I ought to, Heavenly Father, I want to walk with the wise in order to become wise. You know, lay that foundation. Heavenly Father, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Get that foundation. And then when suddenly that lie comes up, then you say, it is written. But you get your mind set for that. And then number four, meditate on the truth. Say these verses over and over and over again. And I'm shutting off in one minute. How about that? Um, I don't know why they did that. But... That's interesting. Meditate on the truth. I better hurry up. That's my timer. Meditate on the truth because at the end of the day, you need to have it saturated. Saturated so you can respond to it. So, in conclusion. <laughs> in conclusion, God has said, you know what? I couldn't make it any easier. I couldn't make it any easier. Thousands of years I've passed this down. My truth, my word, I've given you so many translations. I've given you so many languages of this. I've even had your pastor give you a handout to drive it home. You need to do this, all right? This is not just survival. You need to do this because, listen, this is how you counter, really, the world of lies. This is how you counter yourself full of lies. This is how you become transformed. Ultimately, it's not about what? Prayer. It's not about church. I'm not saying those things are bad. But when you want to counter lies, counter them with the truth. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. God is renewing your mind. Renewing your mind equals a transformed life. But listen, after Jesus said those words, do you know that he died on the cross for your sins? Do you know that he rose from the dead? But do you know that he did all of that so that you would not live in death? So why in the world would you want to put on the old and keep lying? He did it so that you would live in truth. You would live in the new life he gave you. And so, that means Jesus not only came to make your life better, he came to make you better at life with truth. So, practice. It's a discipline. Get at it. Start memorizing. And what are the results going to be? Well, God will make you worthy enough so that when he looks at you and you, he's going to say, oh, there's my son Jesus. As you live, as you look, as you see, and as you talk, just like him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you've made this so simple for us. None of us really have an excuse. I just simply pray that we would begin in this process that you're already doing and you're already at work and you've asked us to partner with you. The renewal of our minds to do it today, to make this, it is written, a lifetime habit. And that we would see you set us free with such incredible fruit that we want to do it again and again and again. For those this morning who are feeling any kind of guilt, I pray that you would move that into a positive direction for what you ultimately want to do through them. Those who wish that they've heard this years ago, I pray that you would begin doing this in their life and that they would just simply teach their kids. It is written. Tell them that this is how you combat temptation. Thank you for never stopping 
to want us to be more like you. Thank you for never stopping to give us your grace. And I just pray you give us the wisdom to know what to do and the courage to do it, even when it's hard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would please stand at this time. On page 159, we have our Apostles' Creed. If you would please turn to one page 59, and we will have this on the screen as well. Let's pray this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus. After each prayer, would you please respond? Hear our prayer. We praise you, Heavenly Father, that you have sent your Son, not in wrath, but in mercy. As we enter this most holy week, ponder the mysteries of your great salvation. Would you show to us the answer to our prayers of Hosanna, save now in the passion, death, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we bring before you the sick, the distressed, the needy. Especially we name Pat, Bob, Bruce, Aaron, Richard, and Fred, and all those that we name now in our hearts. Father, give your abiding comfort in every circumstance, that in Christ we shall not die, but live and declare his works. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, at your table, the afflicted eat the body and blood of your Son and are satisfied. Through our afflictions, deepen our hunger for this table that we may eat and drink and be satisfied by Christ's saving life. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We remain standing as we continue with our preface on page 160. And we continue. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right? salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you holy lord almighty father everlasting god on the tree of the cross you gave salvation to mankind that when death arose then life also might rise again and that he who by a tree once overcame likewise by a tree might be overcome through jesus christ our lord 
Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you. Turn your neighbor this morning and share God's peace. And you may be seated. For those of you online at this point in time, please take your communion kit. And as I give the words to you, please receive both the body and the blood of Christ at your leisure. And so take and eat the very body of Jesus Christ given into death for you. Take the wine, take the grape juice, and hear these words. Take and drink the very blood of Jesus Christ, shed for you the forgiveness of your sins.
We continue with our post-communion collect on 166. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please join in our closing hymn. And again, we thank you so much for coming on this Palm Sunday. Remember, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday at 7 p.m. And of course, we'll meet back here next Sunday. We're going to celebrate 9.30 a.m. See you on Easter. Thanks so much for joining us online as well.